Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the seventh day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. I had an interesting question yesterday that I think is worthy of answer, although to answer it in, in its fullness, if I were to refer to all the scriptural references that apply to this, well, I would be occupied for a month. But uh, I'm going to try to keep it brief. There's many places that handles this issue in the New Testament um, in a fairly small area, so we're going to look at that. But uh, the questions were from Plunkett 68, and this was on the video that I posted where I stand on Israel, Zionism, Hamas, and October 7th. Yeah, my current understanding of those events. <clears throat> and I'm becoming more and more convinced that, uh, well, let's put it this way. The, uh, the Zionist regime, Netanyahu, I put about as much confidence in his words as I do the words that come out of the White House these days. So uh, They're liars. They are liars. And he's not an honorable man. I mean, he's he's uh, he's got all kinds of bribery charges weighing over him, and he basically uh, neutered the courts to protect his own butt. Uh, and Israel was almost going into a state of civil war before October seventh, so he has used this event for his own purposes. He is not an honorable man, not someone who's serving the interest of the nation. We have the same problem in the Washington. People that are, they serve their own political ends and their own political or financial ends rather than uh, doing what they're supposed to be as stewards over the people, servants of the people acting in the best interests of the people, all the people under your control, including the Palestinians. Actually, like, the, like uh, England, prior to the revolution, was actually uh, treating the Native Americans as if they were equal under the dominion of the king, because they were. They were his subjects, just like the colonists were. And that's one of the causes of the revolution. The colonists wanted to expand into Indian territories, and the king said, no, you're not going to take that land from my subjects. And that was one of the major reasons. Look for the money. You know, that, that's, that's a cause. And uh, while I mention that, let me say that Hamas and the resistance among the uh, Palestinians is magnitudes greater, more just, and with greater cause than the American Revolution. The American Revolution was, had, it was not justified. The, the actions of the Palestinians is much, much, much more justified than the American Revolution. I'll get onto that later. Uh, so the, the questions here from Plunkett 68 were, I thought that, I think he might be referring to something I said, because I mentioned that Hamas is actually a legitimate government. Yes, it is. I thought Hamas was a terrorist group until they were voted in as the legitimate government of Palestine. Question. So maybe he's referring to a statement I made. Yes, indeed, they were voted in. If I recall, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, because I remember these things happening, but... You know, it wasn't the focus of my attention at the time. Um, with the, was the Camp David Accords and one of the agreements, uh, began to set up a two-state solution. I'll call, although Israel, though they, though they went along with it, uh, was it uh, Menachem Begin? Perhaps on the surface, behind the scenes, they were working to scuttle the whole thing by establishing settlements that was so they were they pretend to go along with this they pretend to favor it but behind the scenes in reality actually out in the open 
their deeds proclaim something else, that they had no intention of going through with it. Uh, it, it comes, goes back to the peace with Egypt and everything else. But was it, who was it that they had actually had Yasser Arafat? They had a, a meeting. Was that under Clinton? You know, there were so many of those things. Uh, none of them ever solved the problem. So they tended to paper over it. Uh, Trump's agreements were guaranteed to fail because they papered over the issue. The issue, the, the, the problems between the Jews and the, the Muslims in the Middle East there is not because they're Jews and Muslims. It's because of the Palestinians, the Nakba, the great disaster, that injustice, that, which still exists. See, it's an ongoing injustice because they're still refugees. Between three quarters and a million Palestinians were forcibly expelled or deceitfully expelled from the land that became known as Israel in 1948. And uh, they, you know, the, one of the things that the Palestinians have been pressing for was the right to return. No, there's no right to return. The Israel, re, Israel refuses that because they know the Palestinians would outnumber them. They would not be the majority. And so you cannot have, that, that's why, too, that's why they don't give citizenship to the Palestinians in the West Bank or Gaza. They just don't annex it and give them citizenship because they have, it's, it's a Jewish state. See, it's the Judenstadt. It is a Zionist project. They don't want to live in peace in a nation with others. They could have just come here. I mean, right now, too. I mean, uh, the Jews in Israel could simply come to the United States. The, the southern border's open. <laughs> We all half the Jews. This would actually be a solution, but they won't. They wouldn't want to do this. Half the Jewish population in the world, practically, the equal to the number in Israel, lives in the United States. Just bring the rest of them here. I mean, we're not that packed yet. They can clean up the 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 center of Manhattan and those areas that have now become basically empty. We have all these big towers and everything. They're now empty. I'm sure they could make some use out of them, but they wouldn't have their Judenstadt, their Jewish, exclusive Jewish state. And then now they've gone beyond the political Zionism to a religious Zionism, trying to reestablish the temple? Really? So you're going to go back to animal sacrifice? Is this going to be live streamed? It won't pass through the... Uh, Censors at YouTube, really, you're going to sacrifice goats and sheep and oxen and doves daily, all the time? And everybody, all it, it, this is a, this would be a scam. This would be a typical scam. So, under the law of Moses, all the males over the age of 12 have to go up to the temple three times a year. Sukkot, which was one of the instigators of the seventh, was one of those times. Uh, Passover um, and first fruits, Pentecost, and also Sukkot, the three times during the year that every male had to go up to the, to the temple and offer sacrifices and present himself before Yahweh. So, <laughs> hmm. So think of how you could scam that. Admission fees, offerings for sale. This has all been done before. So you have to change your currency into a legitimate shekel uh, to pay the, the necessary uh, things that are required by the law. And you had to have a certified animal that was ritually uh, uh, kosher for sacrifice. So what was happening in those days, people had built, if they brought their own animal, and you're not going to want to bring animals for, say, hundreds, hundreds of miles, uh, the, the people there, the inspectors would, you, you know what they did. No, that's not kosher. You'll have to buy one of ours. We'll, we'll let you trade it in. And then they would probably take it, sell the same animal again to somebody else as being kosher. That's the way human beings are. Just scam everybody all the time, you know. And that was going on in Jesus' day.
the New Testament. That's why he drove them out of the temple. And the money changers, you know, it, not uh, just charging a nominal exchange fee like money changers do, but rather, you know, a couple percent, but rather scam them on that, too, because it had to be in shekels. So denarii, the common currency, wasn't acceptable. It had to be in shekels. <laughs> so they would sell you the exchange your currency for shekels at a real profit because you had no choice. You had no choice. <sighs> Special temple currency. They turned it into a scam. They turned God's house into a scam. Jesus said, my house, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all people, all nations. And you have turned it into a den of thieves. Yeah, they did. Human nature. Not just to choose. Uh, but yeah, they were sinful people. It was like everybody else. So, where was I going with that? Uh, Anyway, the uh, uh, Israel over there, oh, the temple. Yeah, if they rebuild the temple, it doesn't put a, a scam. <laughs> Just like, in fact, near here, they, uh, th there was a Catholic sh shrine that went up. And all it was was a, a place where you can go and buy trinkets and gifts and everything, really. So they, they built this shrine, and what does it do? It raises money for the organization that built it. Uh, tourist trap. In the name of God. Oh, that's despicable. It's just so bad. Now, Roman Catholicism over the centuries had all kinds of scams. Indulgences for sale. Uh, even today, you can buy a mass said for someone. Scam. So you can buy God's blessings. Do you think God approves of that? No, he does not at all. But human beings, that's what they do. We are so bad. And look at what's going on in Israel right now. It's just, these are supposed to be God's people doing this? Really? What they do, they're, demonstrate, they're demonstrating they are hostile toward all human beings, as the Apostle Paul said. So let's go here. Who was a Jew? Um, so... The question was, first question was about legitimacy of Hamas as a government. Yes, there was an election. Um, in fact, I think there was only one election. There was a Hamas as an, uh, an organization, the Islamic resistance movement. So they're um, more of a religious Muslim political party. Uh, as a, and the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization had been historically the major one, and they were more of a secular political party that both parties engaged in acts of terror, just like the Jews did uh, before 1948 and after. I mean, the, the Jewish group Irgun blew up the King David Hotel and killed a whole bunch of British um, people and a lot of civilians, British military and a lot of civilians. So I think the headquarters of the of the British, uh, what do you call them, supervisors, was there. They had the mandate. The whole thing is just a terrible mess and a lot of injustice. And the Palestinians all got the short end of the stick. But yes, there was an election um, that was related to a two-state solution, the beginnings of that. Again, Israel was working behind the scenes to sabotage it every step of the way. But so they had elections in the West Bank and Gaza, and the PA, the which was the successor of the PLO, the Palestinian Administration, lost. And then there was a well, they didn't accept the results of the election. Let's put it that way, and there ended up almost civil war, and in the end, uh, with some help from the Israeli forces, I believe, uh, the Hamas was ended up in control of uh, Gaza and the PA in control of the West Bank. 
Now, there's a, another twist to this whole story, is that once upon a time, apparently, this is what I've read and heard, and Israel had a role in creating Hamas as a counterweight to the PLO or the PA. Same thing. Why? Because divide and conquer. They, they didn't want a unified authority over the Palestinians to keep them together. They wanted to divide the Palestinians one from another, so they helped, helped create Hamas just like the United States creating uh, the Taliban, and, or not the Taliban per se, but the Mujahideen and, and other things, encouraging and warlords, all this other stuff in Afghanistan, and then arming them with like Stinger missiles to, for the purpose of bloodying the Russians. They didn't expect them to win. They just expected, yeah, well, we, we got bloodied pretty bad in Vietnam, and the Russians helped bloody us by supplying surface-to-air missiles and MiG fighter jets to the North Koreans. So, well, this is our, our opportunity to poke the Russians, and that's what happened. Or the Soviets. This was really Soviet. There's another story that goes in that, too. The, the Soviets were really intervening to get rid of a bad communist government that was really going amok, so they were intervening on behalf of Afghanistan. Uh they, their, their purpose was not to conquer. It was to fix a mess, just like in Ukraine. Just like in Ukraine. It was a humanitarian intervention. Uh, the United States took advantage of it to, to, to work them over, supply the, you know, rile up the Mujahideen, work to create them. The CIA was in there and then supply them with, uh, like Stinger man portable man pads to shoot down their helicopters and their jets and make the make this the Soviets bleed 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 bleed. That was what they were trying to do. Lovely, not in the interest of Afghanistan at all. Of course, people like Reagan and that using words like "Well, we're there for the freedom of of the Afghan people." Bunch of BS. If it comes out of Washington, we know what it is. You, have to, you, you know, I've lived long enough that pretty much can say that's all that comes out of Washington. I've lived long enough to hear the words and see the results over and over and over again. <laughs> Don't trust those people at all. It's just like Trump. You look at Trump and you realize that, okay, he sounds good. He had some good policies and... But you look at him, and this man is totally self-obsessed. He's, he's not a responsible man. He should not be given the keys. Of course, Biden, he needs to be institutionalized, 24-hour care. So definitely shouldn't be given the keys. They have to be taken away from him. It's, it's just it's insane. It's, it's some, uh, well, this is a judgment of God in the United States. We're, we're, we've been given this kind of government because it reflects the kind of people we've become. Mm -hmm. Look at the most war-mongering country on earth now. It's the United States. Everywhere. They just want to... People like Lindsey Graham, they just want to bomb everybody. Doesn't matter. Just as long, just like blood and guts and money for defense contractors. Or they should really call them war contractors. You know, the, the Department of Defense used to be called the Department of War, the War Department, which was a more honest name. So, yes, it was a legitimate election. Uh, there hasn't been any elections since. So, this is quite a while ago, either on the West Bank or on, in Gaza. Uh, yeah, then they were recognized. And again, Hamas was, I, I think Hamas got a little out of hand as far as Israel was concerned. They just wanted somebody to, to mess up the PA, to uh, challenge him, to divide the Palestinians, to divide their loyalty, divide and conquer. That's what it was, to weaken them. <laughs> Blowback. 
Well, now the PA is really so compromised in the eyes of the Palestinians. They're not legitimate. I mean, they've, they're basically just serving the state of Israel. They're, um, Vich, the Vichy government of the West Bank. Referring to the French government under the Nazis, the collaborationists. They're collaborationists, to a degree at least. They're they're compromised. Um, yeah. So the next question, which is the more important one, also I am not sure that I understand if the Jews should be invited, inviting Christ through the gospel, or invited to Christ through the gospel. I think. Or they are still under the previous covenant because they are have been hardened. Uh, now, of course, they've been hardened due to their own religion. Well, you could say that about any religion, I suppose. Uh, can they be expected to see Christ as he is at this time? Okay, he's he has some confusion about this. Yes, they can come to Christ. Anybody can come to Christ. Christ, his arms are open to everyone. Um, no, there never was salvation under the old covenant. There is no, never has been so, uh, salvation under the law of Moses. And we're going to take a look at that. And there's many places I can go. Romans 3, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Um, it's really all through the book of Romans, except 12 and on, uh, which is just a practical advice, uh, the whole book of Galatians, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, and lots of other places. Unfortunately, most Christians in the... If I was cynical, I would say uh, uh, Christianity in the United States is designed to keep you from the truth and make you dependent on the preachers. But I don't know if I want to go quite that far. Some of it is. That's... Especially Roman Catholicism with their priest scam. Uh, it's, it, go, it goes back to the Old Testament because, see, and then Jesus said in, in chapter uh, 3 of the Gospel of John, unless you're born again or born from above, it's, 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 which is a literal rendering of that word there, again, it, uh, you cannot even see, you can't even behold the kingdom of God. So you have to, you have to have, God has to be in you. You have to have the Spirit of God in you. You have to be born again, regenerated, in order to perceive and understand the things of God, uh, to have that relationship with God where God dwells in you through his Spirit. You have to be born again, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ, faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, if you're talking to the Jews, uh, or uh, Isa to Muslims. So, Under the law, and you find this in Romans chapter 3 and all through, there is no salvation. There is because by the works of the law shall no flesh be, flesh be justified. No descendants of Adam, no sinful human beings can be justified through obedience to the requirements of the commandments, acts of obedience, because... What does the law do? It shows you you've broken it. And the wages, the, the penalty of breaking the law in its entirety, so if you break one commandment, you've broken the law, is death. So you can't be saved through the law. Through the covenant of Moses, salvation is impossible. Who keeps the, the two great commandments, which is part of the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, all the time. It's not once in a while, it's all the time. And love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, in the same way you love yourself, all the time. How often do you not fulfill those? See, the law has no salvation, has no power to save, can't give life. It simply brings death. It brings a sentence of death. It reveals that you're a sinner and you need something to save you that the law can't give you. So, no, they cannot possibly, nor could they ever, come to God through the law. So let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and read a little bit on this. I'm just choosing this because it's a fairly short section here. But the entire book of Galatians is really about this issue. He, he wrote to the churches in Galatia, which is... 
in the area of eastern Turkey today, uh, Asia Minor, because there had been some teachers that came that was teaching these converts to Jesus, these Christians, that they need to keep the law, or at least one commandment of the law, circumcision, in addition to having faith in Christ. So it was Jesus plus. It was, uh, there's not, it's probably still out there, but there's movement that was pretty active uh, two decades ago called the Hebrew Roots Movement. And they're still out there here and there, although you, you should, generally don't use that term. Uh, they don't use that term so much, but they're there. And what they are is they're Gentiles trying to be Jews. And they basically took the law and add, and replaced the Old Testament sacrificial system with Christ. So it was Christ just was, a, was just the sacrifice for sins, but you still have to keep the law. And they never did answer me about circumcision. <laughs> Had a few debates with them online. But there is no—the law can't give you life, and they hate Paul. Though that group absolutely hates Paul, and so do Jews in general, because they try to that they think, as Jesus talked about the Pharisees, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. He says, "But they speak of me, Jesus. They speak of him, Jesus." They didn't understand. They, they were they they looked at the law as a way to life, when in fact it can't give them life. They didn't read it seriously. There is no hope in the law. It simply condemns you, and that's his purpose. So let's go to Galatians chapter three here, and I'm going to start at verse five, trying to save a little time. Again, read the it's, the, the whole thing is only five chapters long, so. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, so these were born-again, Spirit-filled Christians, and miracles were very common This was at this time. God still does things like that. He just, they, a lot of this, but the, most of what we see in the charismatic movement is not miracles, but God heals people. He usually doesn't do things in a dramatic way. Because uh, a true miracle is an attesting sign. So these are just works of power uh, that's being referred to here. Uh, just God's grace. Uh, charisma, um, you know, the charismatic movement, talk, the charisms of God are just uh, gifts given by God's grace, just freely given. They're, they're not something you can earn. See, you can't make deals with God. It insults him. Uh, you take it at his, on his terms or not. And, but Paul asks this, so, so you've been supplied, God gave you the Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and he does mir miracles among you. He, he heals people. He does all these things among you. Does he do it by the works of the law? In other words, do you earn these things through obedience or by the hearing of faith? In other words, you just believe God's promises, and they happen. I mean, I have prayers answered all the time. It's, it's no big deal. It's God. That's just the way he is. Um, I really want to say this before I get started in this. The cross changed everything. It changed the relationship between God and man from God's side, first of all. Uh, and Paul writes, is it in Galatians or Corinthians? First Corinthians, I think, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. See, in the Old Testament, if you've read the story of the Exodus in particular, it's, 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 it's like God has to keep his distance from the descendants of, of uh, Jacob, the tribes of Israel. He keeps his distance because when they get too close to him, they die. They die. He's holy. They're not. And there's nothing that covers their sin. The, the animal sacrifices weren't sufficient. They don't really take away sin. So these are unregenerate people. They, they still have sinful hearts. They always want to go back to, uh, to Egypt. Uh, they want to, uh, and they always want to worship idols. They all do all these things. 
and that God is is with them, and it's like he has to keep them at a distance through a media, mediators of angels and Moses because they can't come into his presence lest they be consumed. Now, the cross, because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, enables God to get close to us. He ena enables God to dwell in us because our sins have been covered, not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. It changed the way God deals with people because having, having fulfilled the requirements of the law through the death of his son as a sacrifice for sin, an atonement for sin, God is able to treat sinful people in an entire, as, not as judge, but as savior. You understand? I'm trying to s simplify things, but this is really what it is. So in Christ, you have the, the judge paying the penalty himself because Christ will be the judge because he is both God and man. Say, man's not, God is, human beings are going to be judged through a man, Jesus Christ, who is also God. There's reasons, there's a whole lot of reasons why God became man. Didn't cease to be God, but, and he's the second Adam, but he's coming as judge. Make peace with the judge before he arrives, before he takes his seat. His hands, the, his arms are open, and I was, I was being, I'm really distressed by what's going on over there, and I'm praying. I said, God, give me understanding on this. <laughs> you know, why do you allow this? Well, this is the age of grace, and God's purpose now is to call people to Himself out of all nations to be His, His people, to be the true Israel of God those who trust in him. That's his overriding purpose. He is going to judge, but that kind of judgment hasn't come yet because he has this purpose now that must be fulfilled first. Jesus said, the gospel must first be preached as a witness in all the world to all nations, then the end shall come. That doesn't mean everybody is, is converted, but the message of salvation through faith in Christ needs to be preached everywhere, or at least in all nations, tribes, and tongues. And then at, at, when that's preached and all the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, that God is building a temple, then judgment comes. Then the end comes. So God is... God has an overriding purpose that is more important than bringing perfect justice right now. Because if he did, all those people he intends to save would be gone. Because they're sinners. And then again, the cross enables God to act in a way that doesn't demand immediate execution of justice. So we have to remember that when we say, oh, God, you know, why don't you do something? S strike them down, you know? It's like, yeah, but then there's a whole lot of people that get struck down too because God dispenses justice equally without respect to persons. So... We have to keep that in mind. There's a reason God delays and restrains things. And we're coming close to that time when just judgment will come. It is always comes to a degree when he t turns you over to your own sinfulness when you reject the light. Uh, but, uh, you know, being a wicked sinner is God's judgment on you. It's your own work. You've, you've, you've given yourself over to it, but that's God's punishment too. You don't want me? Okay, I'll let you go the way you want. Not going to end well. It's like the prodigal son. You know, maybe you'll come to your senses when you're starting, when you can't eat, when you're starving and you want to eat what the pigs are eating, maybe you'll come to your senses. 
it's it's like a a parent, a father, especially a father, than a, rather than well, the prodigal son's a good example. Sometimes the only thing you can do with a a son or daughter is is let them do what they're going to do because they won't listen and you can't restrain them, and just hope that when they start experiencing the the fruit of their journey, their path they're on, that they'll come to their senses and return. You know, and they're out homeless on the street, and there's so many, so many runaways, that's where they end up. They end up on the street prostituting themselves, boys and girls, and drug addicts and And all you can do is hope perhaps they'll come to their senses like the prodigal and say, you know, my parents weren't that bad. I wonder if they take me back. Um, so let's go to over here to uh, Galatians here. Again, the cross changed the way God relates to human beings. Remember the flood? You think the earth doesn't deserve that again? Well, God promised he's not going to do it that way again, but, you know, judgment swept away everyone but eight people. God's got a purpose, and it's restoring fallen creation, not destroying fallen creation. Jesus said, I, I have not come to destroy, but to save. To save sinners. And if you've destroyed them, you can't save them. So... That's why these things go on. It's, it's, it's like, ah. yeah, I understand, but it's so hard to look at. Yeah, it is. He has to look at it. If we, if we can't stand to look at this sin, imagine God seeing this. If it wasn't the cross for the cross, we'd all be smoked. Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 5. Therefore, who, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, obedience, works of obedience, earning it, or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is all mirrored from, from uh, the Old Testament and from the book of Romans, which Paul also wrote. Yeah. You know, more extensively. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of God, the sons of Abraham, excuse me, sons of Abraham. Only those who are of the faith of Abraham, believing God, they are the sons of Abraham. Not those that don't believe God, but those who do. Not those who try to earn salvation through keeping the commandments through the covenant of Moses, they can't. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 10. He, he talks about the Jews who, who stumbled over the stumbling block by thinking that righteousness was through obedience to the commandments rather than through faith. See, Paul talks very much, very extensively about these things in Romans and Galatians and other places, but these are the made, major, major bodies of why salvation is by grace through faith in Christ rather than by keeping the commandments. And the, then you have the epistle of Hebrews, which is written probably not by Paul. I does, he doesn't, doesn't sound like Paul to me, but covers sort of the same area. It's addressed to a Jewish believing audience who's being pressured, suffering tribulation, being pressured to go back to the law and to the, the temple. And the, the author of Hebrews there made it may have been Apollos or an associate, probably an associate of Paul, uh, because it's very Pauline in its contents, but not its style, is, is arguing from the law and the promises of the new covenant, there's nothing for you in the law. It never could save you. God has brought in salvation in the new covenant in Christ. And to go back to that is to go back to what can't save you anything anyway. It's the same thing. We Really, the content's the same as you see here in Galatians. 
Now, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Paul's overriding message in everything he preaches is salvation is by the grace of God. The unmerited, undeserved kindness and benevolence of God, goodness of God, through faith, in other words, it's a gift, it's not something that you can buy, through faith, through trust in Jesus Christ, and that alone. That's sufficient. Faith is sufficient. Faith in Jesus, in Yeshua, in Isa, in Jesus, is sufficient for salvation. And if you add, try to add something to it, you're, you're, you're really saying that it's not sufficient. It needs more. It needs more than Christ dying on the cross for the sins of the world. And that's an insult, that is insulting Christ and is trampling his blood underfoot. As, you know, going back to, the, that's the point of, in Hebrews, going back to the law is basically discarding Christ, discarding the cross. It's going back to the blood of sheep and goats, which can't take away sin. <clears throat> And the scripture, verse 8, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. See, the good news that God will ju justify the Gentiles, too. See, under, under the law, the law, the Mosaic covenant was given only to those people at Sinai. It was not given to the world. Old Testament Judaism, as uh, rabbinic Judaism today, is not a global religion. It is not a, a, a religion given to the entire world. It's given to only a particular people. It was never intended to be the universal religion. There are really only two universal religions. One is Christianity and the other is Islam. And Islam is insufficient to save you. It has no salvation in Islam. They have nothing like the cross. They even have nothing like the Ten Commandments. Read the Quran. Compare it with the Gospels. Compare it with the New Testament. Read the Quran and compare it to the New Testament and see which one you'd like to, to, to believe in. Which is what I would say to, to all Muslims out there. Read the New Testament. The Injil. And compare it to the Quran. Which one would you like better? Which one has better promises for you? Which one gives you eternal life as a free gift? Through mere faith in, what, in, in who Jesus Christ is and what he did for you. There's nothing like that in the Quran, is there? There's no certainty of salvation. There is no, there is no atonement for you in the Quran. Moses or uh, Muhammad was a prophet of the one God. In this sense, he preached there was one God in a pagan polygamous society. I think they had 360 idols in Mecca. He preached the one God. And he talked about God sent messengers, the prophets, Moses and the prophets and Jesus. But Muhammad claimed to be the last one. He probably believed he was a prophet, but his message wasn't consistent with Moses and the prophets and the Injil, the gospel, which is why Christians don't accept him as a prophet. His message isn't consistent with the ones that came before. Isn't Allah, isn't Allah consistent with himself? Of course. Of course, the one true God. Now, I understand why you have trouble understanding the incarnation, that, that God became man, and the idea of what's called Trinity, but it's not incomprehensible. I mean, it, it's beyond our total understanding, but it's because it's revealed in the scriptures, we can accept it. It's there. It's, it's necessary uh, in order to make sense out of the scriptures. And some of it's explicitly stated, like, like the... Uh, 
the incarnation of Christ. And the Word who was God became flesh and dwelt among us. We don't believe in three gods. We say one. I know the Quran says do not Christians do not say three. We don't. We say one. Now how we took, but that one God reveals himself to us as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God. But it's not simply God putting on three faces. It's more complicated than that. We have trouble talking about it. So, for, for, for you know, because it's, the Scripture starts with there's only one God— but then he says, let us make man in our own image. The one God, one essence, one being. Let us. Allah in the Quran often uses the first person plural pronoun, we. We, 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 right? So your own scripture bears witness to the fact that there is one God, but there is a certain plurality in God. Not three individuals, but we. All right, let's go on. You might, if, if Christians, you might want to ask uh, Muslims about that. <laughs> They, they might be a little puzzled, but that's good. As I said, give them a New Testament. Read this. If, they're, if they love the truth, if they want the truth, there is, it's so much better than the Quran. There, there is a legitimacy in the Quran as far as declaring the one God, yes. But there's a deficiency there, too. The revel it's just like the Old Testament. The revelation of the one God in the Old Testament in places, it's like Job. You know, it's like I would never tell somebody to read the book of Job because it's it's a very, very, very old book. It predates Moses probably. And uh, it's not a sufficient revelation of God's character at all. It's a defective revelation of God's character. in quite a few ways. So, you know, uh, Christians, we recognize generally 66 books. It's not one book. But, uh, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't mind talking to a Muslim. You know, you, I, I can't speak Arabic, so I have, I have a, a disability when it comes to the Quran and reading it the way it is. But I do have translations of it. And if it can't be translated, then there's something defective there, too. Then it's not a religion for all peoples. Now, again, uh, the Quran, uh, Islam is a religion for all peoples. It's not a particular... It's not for Arabs only. It's not for Palestinians only. It's not for, for uh, others only. It's for the whole world. Is it not? Indeed, it is. The, the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Yes, I'm going back a little bit. Uh, preach the gospel to Abraham, the good news. Gospel means good news. It's, it's a particular kind of good news, too. It's the good news of a victory. And what's the victory? over the fall, over the, uh, the disaster, the Nakba that occurred in the Garden of Eden with the fall of humanity. We were created to be the image of God, and we lost it because of sin. We disobeyed. Adam willfully disobeyed God. He knew what God had said. Personally, he'd heard it. It was spoken to him, and he disobeyed and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the, the tree of life was there, and there was no command for them not to eat of that tree. 
until after they sinned. Now, in Christ, the tree's open. It's open again. The barrier has been removed. The tree of life is there for whosoever will. The tree of life is Jesus Christ. The Scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, in addition to the Jews, not separately, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. All the nations. All the ethnos. All the peoples shall be blessed in Abraham. Why? Well, Paul tells us. So then, those who are of the faith, who are of faith, are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law, seeking to find life through obeying commandments, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. See, the law, people that think that the Jews can come and be justified in God's sight by keeping the law can't because they forget there's an entire sacrificial system. The entirety of the law must be kept, including the great commandments. And to, to knowingly break a commandment, there's no atonement for that anyway. There's no atonement or the law for a willful sin. And who has not willfully sinned? knowing that something was wrong and you did it anyway because you wanted to. See, there is no salvation under the law. There is no life under the law. There's only condemnation unless you keep it perfectly. And one man did keep it perfectly, the man Jesus Christ, who was also the Son of God. In order that he would receive the blessings of the law so that all that are in him not only have their sins atoned for by his death, but through his obedience have, are, are also heirs of the promises of the law and the blessings of Abraham. He fulfilled the law. He did not destroy the law. He fulfilled it by keeping it. And those who are in him have the blessings of the law in him. So then those who are of, the, are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Uh, James says to break one commandment is to break them all. Why? Because the law is a unit. It is one law. It's not laws, plural. It's laws, singular. The entire body of God's revelation from Moses and the prophets, really, are the law. And you have to keep the entirety of it in order to receive the blessings. If you don't, you receive the curses. And you can go read the blessings, but the curses follow. And realize there is no blessing for a sinner under the law, a person who has sinned at all. And Christians don't know these things, nor do the Jews. They, they, they try to be, they, they think doing a commandment is a good thing that gets them credit, a mitzvah, a good work. And if you have enough, enough, enough mitzvahim, enough good works, then you're acceptable to God. No, you're not. See, this is, this is not, uh, rabbinical Judaism is not uh, the Mosaic Covenant at all. It is, it is a man-made thing. Substitute for it because the temple's gone, because God removed the temple because it was obsolete. But rather than turn to the Messiah, the Pharisaical sect, the sect of the Pharisees, in general, held to their 
uh, their Pharisaism, which was a which was not the covenant of Moses anyway, in a system of works, of good works. It was a, holding to the, the teachings of the rabbis rather than to Moses and the prophets and the Messiah. It was a different system, and it is today. And it would be to, uh, to rebuild the temple would cause a crisis for the Jews of this world. Because it would destroy rabbinical Judaism. But there's no salvation under the law. The covenant of Moses cannot give you life, only death, if you've sinned at all. <sighs> but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Quoting from the Old Testament, I believe. <clears throat> Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. It, just says, it promises life to those who perfectly keep the commandments. One man did that. Yet the law is not of faith, for the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, What's the curse of the law? Death. Having become a curse for us. As it, uh, for it is written, curses is everyone who hangs on a tree. He took the curse of the law upon himself as a substitute, as a sin bearer, as a sacrifice. When you sacrifice an animal, the animal doesn't become sinful as far as doing evil, but it bears the penalty of sin. When it says Jesus became sin for us, it is used in the sense of a sin bearer who takes the penalty of sin, not one who does sin, but the penalty of the guilty one instead in his place. That the blessings of Abraham, he became a curse for us, that the blessings are accursed, as if he was guilty, a, an offering for sin, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, in the Gentiles in addition to the Jews. So he's, he's, he's writing to the Gentiles here. So because in Abraham, it is said, it was promised to Abraham that in you, all the nations shall be blessed. Again, Christianity fulfills the promise of Judaism, Christianity as Christ, not a religious system, but Christ himself, fulfills the promises to Abraham of a universal salvation for all, not just for some, but for all who have faith in Christ, in the Messiah, in Esau. Yet the... Uh, Excuse me. <coughs> it's just a touch of COVID, I think. How do I know? Because I can't smell anything again. Other than that, it's no big deal. That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's a new covenant one of the, that God would come and dwell in us, which is restoring the breach that occurred in the Garden of Eden. God in you, the hope of glory, that we might be the image of God in Christ. It's, it's, it restores that relationship with God. A born-again Christian has a restored relationship in, in which that God actually dwells in us, which you can't really see from the outside, which is in incredible. I mean, we're, uh, we are still of sin. We, our bodies are—sin still dwells in our mortal bodies. And it's, the Spirit of God could not possibly dwell in us unless God had made atonement for our sins in Christ on the cross. Only because of that can the Spirit of God dwell in us, because He is holy— 
and we are not. Again, God treated prior to the cross in the Old Testament, especially in the Exodus, you can see that, that God kept man, sinful man, at arm's distance, lest he destroy them. God was in Christ on the cross reconciling the world to himself, satisfying his justice through the death of his son as a sin offering, as an atonement. Now to Abraham and his seed, singular, he's talking about a singular seed, a single descendant, not all the descendants of Abraham where the promise is made. He makes that clear in other places in Galatians there. He does not say, or it says right here, excuse me, and to seeds as of many, but of as of one, and to your seed who is Christ, the Messiah, Isa. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant which was confirmed before God, before by God in Christ that it should make uh, the promise of no effect. In other words, God can't change the conditions. It was given to Abraham as an unconditional promise. And there was no conditions that Abraham had to fulfill. It was given to him, the covenant, the promises of a covenant, the promises that his seed uh, in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And other promises. So you can't add, you see, you got an unconditional promise, you can't add conditions later, is what, he, what Paul is saying here. So 430 years later, where Moses brought the law, that can't alter the covenant that was given, the promises that were given to Abraham. And his, the promises to Abraham was for all the world. For if the, in the if, if for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but get but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Till until the seed, singular, who is Christ, the Messiah should come to, to whom the promise was made. It was promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, that is, to Christ. That Christ should be the inheritor of the world. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator, Moses, I think. So God, it, God did not directly appear to Moses in the bush, in the burning bush, because as we hear, as Jesus himself says in the Gospels, no man has seen God at any time. No descendant of Adam has seen God at any time. So Moses didn't actually behold God directly, but beheld him through angels, messengers. Just like the Quran. Um, it, it, the Quran says that the, the uh, Mo, uh, Muhammad says the, the messages came to him through a mediator, that is uh, the angel Gabriel, I believe. Not God directly, but through a mediator, through a messenger. <clears throat> now, a mediator does not mediate for only one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been give, uh, for if there had been a law given which could have given life 
I'm so used to the King James that this is a little difficult for me to read. Um, but it is more understandable than the King James. Truly, righteousness would have been uh, would have been by the law. So, if the law, what Paul's saying here, if a law had been given that could give life, then eternal life, restoration of that life, uh, that co living connection with God. See, the death that came in the garden initially was being cut off from God and the life that is in God. They didn't die physically immediately, but they were cut off from that relationship with God. And God is life. But the scripture has confined all under sin, the law in this particular case, the written law, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In other words, all come to him on equal terms. If it was possible to obtain life through the law, then why would God have sent a Savior? You just have to work for it. But that's not what God did. He wants to give it as a free gift to all, not to Jews only, but to all, to all nations. The law was not given to all nations. But before faith came, before access to God through faith, through the faith in Christ, through the atonement that Christ had uh, purchased, We were kept under guard or under supervision by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. See, the law is only temporary until Messiah comes and fulfills his purpose of making atonement for the sins of the entire world. And the proof that God has given to all mankind that he accomplished this was that Messiah rose from the dead. Christ rose from the dead. Esau did indeed rise from the dead. He died on the cross, truly, but not as a sinner. He suffered death as a sinner. His body died, but he did not remain dead. He rose, proving that he accomplished the atonement of, for sin. For if he was bearing the sins of the world and his death did not actually atone for it, as if he were himself actually a sinner, then he would not have been able to rise from the dead. Death could not hold him because he was not personally guilty of any sin. He voluntarily bared our, bore our sin as a sin offering. And Islam has the concept of sin offering, and I think they still do, um, on occasion, an animal sacrifice. What is the purpose of that? Is it not as a sin bearer? Which is a shadow, a type, a figure of God's perfect atonement that came to come to pass in the Messiah? That is where the Quran is lacking. It does not have an atonement. How can God forgive sins if God is perfect and holy? How can God forgive sins? Quran doesn't answer that. Not in a satisfactory way, at least. Well, because God can do what he wants. No, God can't do what... Well, God wants what is consistent with his own nature. If God is good and holy and just and righteous and God is love, God is mercy, he can only act in a way that is consistent with his nature. God, as the scripture says, God cannot lie. Why? Why? because it's inconsistent with who God is. He is truth. 
He can't act contrary to his own nature. Human beings can act. Human beings can lie. God can't lie. God can't do anything or everything. God can only act in accordance with who he is. I'm sure Islam agrees. Has to. Judaism must agree with that. Has to. Scripture, but Scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to all who believe. Jews, Gentiles, Muslims, um, Christians, Hindus, Sikhs. Who else? Are, are, <laughs> there's, there's so many different ones. Native Americans, pagans, idolaters, uh, the Druze, everyone. The, the, his, God's arms are open to you all because of what Christ did on the cross. Offered atonement for the sins of the entire world, for you all. But the, the, uh, the, to receive that, you have to believe in his atonement, which is Christ, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, which is a proof God has given to you all, to us all, that he did accomplish his work of atonement. And when he died on that cross, the curtain, the barrier in the temple that separated the, the uh, what might be called the apartment of God, the holy of holy place where the, his, uh, the light of God dwelled, the, the glory, the Shekinah of God over the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the law of Moses. That curtain, when Jesus died, which the uh, historian Josephus, who was lived in those times, said was four inches thick and teams of horses couldn't tear it, was ripped from top to bottom the moment Christ died, signifying that the way to God was now open. Prior to that, only the high priest once a year could enter in to offer atonement on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the law. And if he entered improperly or acted improperly, he was struck dead immediately. No one else could enter. They would tie a rope to his ankle that in case he messed up, they could get the body out. But when Christ died, that separation between God and man was ripped from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, and God can approach you, and you can approach God. His arms are now open. He is not separated himself. He is open to sinners because he has atoned for your sin. You can come freely to him in faith. To him. I'm not talking to, about a religious system. I'm talking about through faith in the Messiah. Not a system of religion but a person, God's Savior, who is God and man, who died for the sins of the world and rose from the dead. So therefore, uh, before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, under supervision, uh, uh, talking about the Jewish people, kept for the faith that would be afterward be revealed. See, that was only the law of Moses is not an eternal covenant. It was simply a temporary thing put in place because of transgressions to keep the people of Israel in a state that would enable them to fulfill the purpose through the Messiah, who is the singular seed of Abraham to whom the promises were given. The promise was given to Abraham and to that seed, not to Israel in general not to the people in general, but to that seed. And in him, they also inherit the blessings through faith, but not outside of faith. Therefore, the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ that may, might, might be justified by faith. It instructs us, it, it condemns us, and shows us our need for a Savior, for an atonement for our sins, 
a different way because through the law, you cannot possibly come to God. It condemns you. You're guilty because of the law. Apart from the law, there is no sin. Sin brings condemnation, or, or the law brings condemnation. Where there is no law, neither is there violation. Therefore, the law became our tutor, our, our pedagoga. Uh, what is it? it? It's a, the word tutor here is of an individual. Um, let's read here. Pedagogus. A tutor, uh, i.e. a guardian and a guide for boys among the Greeks and the Romans, uh, the name was applied to the trustworthy slaves who were charged with the duty of supervising the life and morals of, of boys belonging to the better class. Boys were not allowed to do so much as to step out of the house without them before arriving at the age of manhood. In other words, uh, uh, boys were under the supervision of a slave, a, a guide, a guard, to the, the, who would watch over them and instruct them about how to grow up and to be an honorable man. So both as a role of teacher, protector, and uh, supervisor, <laughs> babysitter, sort of, to make sure they, they acted properly and learned how to act as proper men. For you all, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. This, this New Testament is full of this. For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, the word baptized is commonly thought to refer to being immersed in water. But water immersion uh, as, an, as the uh, testimony of salvation is just a sign of the real baptism, which is immersion in Christ by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit puts us in Christ. It is a supernatural work. The water is just an external sign or symbol of that. It is not the thing itself. It just represents the work of the Spirit in the believer the transforming work and the, the presence of the Spirit of God in you, who is also the Spirit of Christ, uh, is what makes you a Christian. That is the, the true mark of what a Christian is, that Christ in you, that's the hope of glory, not belonging to a religious system, which, unfortunately, I fear much of what Christianity is is simply an external religious system, not, not the thing itself. But there are people in all denominations, in every nation, tribe, and tongue, who do have trust in Christ himself. It is a personal relationship with God through personal faith in Christ, not a system of religion. Whether you're Roman Catholic or, or Orthodox or Protestant or Baptist or whatever you are, if you have personal faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, and you trust that that is sufficient for your salvation, then you're a Christian. If you don't, you're not, regardless of what you might call yourself or somebody else might call you. So this baptism into Christ is the work of God, is being referred to here, although typically Christians, when they become Christians, uh, confess that baptism, Baptism in water is a authorized testimony of salvation. Identifying yourself with Christ and the Christian community in the presence of the Christian community, normally. Not necessarily, absolutely has to be that way, but you can't baptize yourself. So a, you, you have to be baptized by a Christian uh, who's bearing witness that, that you have uh, accepted Christ. You'd say, and there's a confession. You are confessing Christ as your Savior and Lord when you receive baptism, which is usually by immersion, historically, too. It's for the first thousand years. Changing things for the matter of convenience is not exactly appropriate, but there are, there are situations, and always been situations, where like pouring was substituted 
because of circumstances, like a person was on their deathbed or something like that. And they, they want to publicly testify that, that they trust in Christ. But uh, water baptism is not essential for salvation. If a person confesses, uh, confessing Christ, you could say is, that you uh, publicly confess that he is your Savior and Lord. You trust in him. Identify yourself with him. If you're not willing to do that, you're not really a Christian. For as many as of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, the, the salvation, the question about wh whether the Jews can be saved through the law is, no, they can't. They never could be. They were awaiting the coming of God's salvation in Christ. They were awaiting the coming of the new covenant. They were awaiting the, coven, the coming of the true universal religion that is called Christianity, even though what's perceived as Christianity by the world is not the real thing. I mean, the Pope in Rome is not Christianity. Uh, men have corrupted Christianity and created these institutions they call churches. No, the true church is all those who believe in Christ. It is supernatural. It is a, a relationship with God and with one another in Christ because Christ dwells in all his people and we have, have a connection with each other because of that a very intimate connection with each other. We love one another because Christ is in us all. So we love our brethren because Christ is in them. And we love him. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise made to Abraham. And the promises of the law because Christ kept the law. So all the blessings of the law are his. And if you are his, you are heirs to the blessings, too. The Jews have no right, unbelieving Jews have no right in Palestine at all. They have, they're, they're under the condemnation of the law. They do not keep the law. They don't even try to keep the law, because they can't. It's not possible. It was only temporary. It's done away with. It's been fulfilled. It no longer has any value. Its purpose was fulfilled in Christ's coming. And he atoned for all the sins. He's, he's atoned for the complete penalties of the law. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's obsolete. It still has a purpose. There is still a purpose of, of revealing to a degree what's right and wrong, but it is not a way to life. It only condemns. It's the way of death. It condemns people if you try to to be right with God through the law, you will only be condemned, and doubly so because you're not accepting the salvation that God freely offers and instead trying to earn a salvation, which is not a good thing to do at all. It is, it is disregarding the gift of God who, and of Christ who, who sacrificed his life for the sins of this world trampling underfoot his blood as if it was an unclean thing. Useless. You're dissing God. You're disrespecting God and his son, who is God. I mean, we're not talking about two separate gods. We're two separate beings. But in Christ, there is this union between God and man. And that can be because God created man in his own image. So Adam, uh, Christ is the second Adam. He is born of a virgin, so he is not of the sinful nature of Adam. He is of the Father, and but he is truly man because he is of the seed of woman. And I don't want to speculate on the genetics of that, but there is a difference between a man and a woman genetically, too. Obviously, there is actually something that a man has that the woman doesn't. So there is a, uh, the scripture says in John chapter 1 that God, the, the word who was God, who is God, 
became flesh and dwelt among us. He took on a true human body that is truly human, and it's not a, a separate creation because it's of the woman, Mary. So he has a body that comes of Mary through a miraculous work of God, and he has a human nature that comes through that, but he is also divine. He is of God. He is God. So he is the true image of God in human form, fulfilling God's purpose in Genesis, in the beginning. Let us make man in our image and let him rule. Christ is the one who fulfills God's purpose of creation. And all those who are in him are heirs with him of all things. Inherit all things with him. And will be glorified together with him when he comes. None of that is possible through the law. And the Quran does not have those promises. It is very much lesser promises that are available only through good works, not through faith, not through mere faith, but through good works. But Abraham's promises were given because Abraham believed, unconditional promises. You don't have to earn them. They're given to you simply because you believe God and believe in what he did in sending his son, the Messiah. Again, this is not, I think Muhammad did not understand the incarnation. I don't think any of us understand the incarnation. But the scripture reveals it. And the word who is God became flesh. Now, he didn't cease to be in heaven because he says later, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, who is in heaven. So while Jesus was on earth as a man, he was also seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Not a separate being, but one being with God and being God. To be the image of God, truly, you have to also be the image of God, or be God himself, because you can't represent God in any kind of likeness. It has to, only God can be God. Again, as, as Christians, as when we're conformed to the image of Christ, God in us. So we can be the image of God as his temple with God dwelling in us, not as separate deities but being united together with God in a somewhat similar manner, I dare say, to, to Christ being God and man at the same time. There's a union there, a connection. Uh, the Apostle Peter, who was uh, uh, sort of the, the leader of the, the, the apostles, disciples, he says we become partakers of the divine nature. That doesn't mean we become separate deities, but we are united in a union with God. I, th I believe there's actually some um, sects among Muslims that have a somewhat similar idea. And the Orthodox Christians have an idea they call theosis, which is not becoming gods, but, be but becoming united with God in a particular kind of relationship. And I think they're correct. I don't know the details of it. I don't know if they know the details of it. And it's a mystery. But we shall be conformed to the image of Christ, who is a union of God and man. Difficult concept, admittedly. But that's what the, teacher, the Scripture teaches. It's the kind of thing we can't come up with on our own, but it is something that has been revealed to us by God. And it is not a corruption. Human beings do not, do not come up with those kind of ideas. And we, if we did, it would not be truth. But because Jesus Christ taught these things and he rose from the dead, that is the evidence God has given to everyone that it is true. And there was an abundance of eyewitnesses. And this occurred in a community. 
It's not like somebody could write these things down and make them up later. No, this did not come through one man. There were many, many eyewitnesses to these events, and they, the apostles were living uh, witnesses of these, and they wrote their uh, memoirs down in the Gospels and in the epistles in the, in the presence of living eyewitnesses of these events. It wasn't done in some secret place someplace. Nor would the community of Christianity, accept, of Christians, have, have accepted that kind of stuff. See, it's, it is not simply a book, but a living community, a, a living body of believers who bring the faith forward too. There's not separate things. But the, 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 what we need to know was all written down in the scriptures in the first century, in the, in the presence of living witnesses. Just as the Quran was written down by the witnesses that heard Muhammad speak. Am I not correct? So it wasn't the, the written Quran was... A body of that was heard uh, that heard body of people that heard the uh, uh, the utterance of Muhammad as he brought forth the the revelations of the Quran. So it wasn't dependent on one witness, other than Muhammad himself. In that case, you only have one witness, and you don't have a miracle. That's that would be a weakness, I would say. But, uh, you know, if I was going to challenge the Quran, I would say, wait a minute, where, where's the evidence that this is a revelation of God, not just the claims of one man? Where's the miracles to prove it? It's like God himself, the revelation of the New Testament, claims the resurrection is a proof God has given to all humanity, that Jesus is the Christ, the one who is coming to judge the living and the dead. which means he is God, but he's a man who's coming. He appointed a man to judge. So he's God and man. Amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And it's a hard to, it's, it's, I would say, beyond human comprehension, but it's true, nevertheless. God is beyond human comprehension. But that does not mean we cannot know him because what God has given us in Christ Jesus, he's the arms that relationship is to open to whoever will come. God invites all to come and, and receive the gift of eternal life, to live forever with God in his very presence. It has better promises than the Quran. Better promises than the law of Moses, for sure. Of those two, if it's a choice between the revelation of the Quran as a way of salvation and the law as a way of salvation, the Quran is easier. <laughs> but the gospel is the only real way because the Quran does not have a sure way of salvation that, that is testified to by miracles, by the resurrection. Muhammad did not raise from the dead. Well, I hope that answers the question about uh, can the Jews be saved through the law? No, they can't. Nor can anybody be saved through the law. Salvation is only in Christ Jesus. And yes, of course, we're supposed to preach the gospel to all the world. And it began by preaching it to the Jews. All the early believers were Jewish. It was only later that they discovered that God had planned to bring the message to the Gentiles, too. Salvation for the entire world. Through faith as a free gift of God received by faith in Jesus Christ.